uh, in 2010 out of our apartment. Of high school was 9-11. There were oil wars all through my formative youth. Uh, and this, is, this was an important issue for us. Brett and I graduated in 2020 when there were not a lot of jobs. So we decided, okay, we'll make our own jobs. Let's see if we can sell e-bikes. Um, and that's how we ended up opening the new wheel. And it's been phenomenal to see the distance one can take a city or a group of riders in a rather short period of time just by caring deeply. And so I'm really stoked at the opportunity that we have as a state. Uh, go ahead and head with cars. A lot of a lot of trips. Great. So thank you for our panelists for being here. So let's start today with a little bit of a conversation about the advantages of e-bikes today. Um, we know that a lot of folks will use e-bikes recreationally, but uh, also we're seeing more and more folks uh, switch to e-bikes for commuting. So Pete or Karen, you want to spin? So, so a, a great example. example. Oh. Not really. Well, okay. kind, of. kind of. All right. So, so a great, great example, example of this is yeah. yesterday. Uh, we took 15 people across and did a San Francisco bike, bike tour. And there was a number of people that were on an e-bike for the first time. And when we got to the hills, it just changed the way that they could get up the hill easily with less effort. So when you think about commuting, what's the big challenge when you're trying to commute into work? You show up, you're sweaty, you're hot. E-bikes open that up differently. You can commute easily. You can also turn the power off on a bike and get the exercise you need. But it just opens up that door as far as capabilities um, of where you can get to and from, especially a city like San Francisco, right? And there's so many hills. We were getting on the ferry last night after our ride, and I saw a lot of people commuting off in bikes. And I looked behind me at the hill they're about to go up, and I was like, well, I hope most of them are on e-bikes because I wouldn't make it otherwise. Um, but I think that's a big thing that it does. It opens up not just the topography, but the distance as well. So most e-bikes are going to be able to and um, so just think of, you know, if you can do, you know, a, a class two e-bike does 20 miles an hour at max speed. So if you could do, let's say, 15 to 20 miles an hour, you could commute on a bike a large, long distance, saving the environment, helping the environment, and just enjoying the ride in a lot more than I think you would uh, behind the wheel of a car and the frustration of stop and go. I know every time I bike into an office or a location we have, it just... I don't know, it just changes the way I feel in the mornings. How many people here have ridden an e-bike? Okay. How many people had ridden an e-bike five years ago? Okay. Yay! What's your name? Hi, Smitty. No, that's okay. Uh, okay, so the number one thing that has changed in e-bikes is how many people have ridden them how available they are, how the price points, the quality, all sorts of things. It will surprise you to know that 10 years ago, bikes at the lower price point were actually pretty widely available in America because stores like, uh, oh my God, I'm having a total brain fart up here right this second, but uh, Best Buy sold basically class two e-bikes 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the thing that didn't exist was higher quality, vehicular quality bicycles that were really built to replace cars, built to climb and descend really steep hills, um, and built to last in the way that an item that costs $1,500 to $10,000 has to, has to be reliable. And so, um, I think the question was what, like, where are we at in the, in the industry? What's up? Okay, well, at the New Wheel, we've been seeing all sorts of people. Like, I've been telling 
So full bike industry, look, this is not a, there is no demographic for e-bikes. So all you people who think that there's a demographic for e-bikes, it's called you're human. So uh, we've been helping people who had various abilities, various income levels, various needs for 10 years. The uh, thing that is so exciting right now is that we have a much more open mindset around it. We used to have to explain to people at such length what an e-bike was before they would get onto it. And now everybody at least knows somebody who has tried an e-bike. And they're like, oh, I want to try this. This is going to be magic. This is going to be fun. This is going to make bicycling fun for me. Because the reality is bicycling has not always been fun for everybody, right? Like, I was born in Copenhagen. And in Copenhagen, bicycling is fun and convenient and accessible. In San Francisco, I don't care how many, like, bike lanes you have, it's hard like it's really hard for example like if you just had a kid or if you broke your knee or if you didn't sleep well last night it's really hard and so the doors are open people understand this as a potential uh solution to all those things your question now so it strikes me in, the, in on these policy levels that most americans many americans have made a, a massive investment in our transportation infrastructure it's called like a personal vehicle right and they pay every month for gas and insurance and all this stuff and so when we're asking them to make another investment that's it's a tall ask, and that's one of the really cool things about the rebates. Have you thought about pitching trading programs for cars? We, we pitched it all. Uh, <laughs> we were throwing spaghetti at the wall and we <laughs> uh, 
Um, but no, absolutely. We think, you know, here in California, you're on the precipice of something like that. You have your capital control program specific for air quality. But I think that model is really good for any ideas that we can have many things so far, but it's, it's really sort of the first step to the federal level. It's harder to have to do everything. So it's really hard to do the federal level. But um, the state level, you know, it's hard to do the federal level. But, you know, tax credit is sort of that first easy lever that, like, the Congressman can have. Let's take advantage of the easy tools we have with the federal government. Let's make this the foundation of federal e bike policy and go from there. So I think the tax for hunters or the trade in program, so it's absolutely in our future. Um, but I think what's more exciting is putting that to the state and local level, where we have some more creativity and responsibility to be on the Actually, this morning, breakfast, Noah and I were also talking about how we might be able to make some of those things. So, it really help us find the support of business and the public business and the support that we can provide. Uh, as an example, uh, LACC has from the LA Water and Power to run a better program where uh, we are giving all the Twelve-year-olds on e-bikes is like one of my favorite problems in the world. Right? It's a significant problem. I see it in my neighborhood. But how rad, right? Like totally rad. So I want to first start by saying that I think it's our job to be really positive. There is too much negativity. These kids have a big, big problem on their hands. And it's the making of the last 150 years that we've cooked up the problem we've got. But there's good news. The carbon cycle is like 125 years, which means that when their kids are adults, if we make major changes in our behaviors or if our 12-year-olds make major changes in their behaviors, there's actually hope, right? So this is not like the end of history. We can't be assholes. Like it's really important. Anyways, I just were on stage. But um, so anyway, that's the first thing. The second thing is from a really actionable standpoint, I think there is a lot that we can do in terms of just getting into schools through like, uh, um, through, oh my gosh, what is it called? Uh, safe routes to school. Um, but just through direct work with educators, with libraries, with parents. Um, I think the work that bike coalitions do is really important. I do a lot with the San Francisco Bike Coalition. And honestly, one of the really big benefits of the, um, of the pandemic was that being able to bring education to a digital platform makes it more accessible for people who have kids who are busy, who can't like drop everything and show up somewhere. 
Um, and so I'm a big fan of the idea of like creating classes for 10 and 12 year olds on a computer where we can just be like, hey guys, this is what it's like to have responsibility when you're 12. It means that the sign that it says stop, you actually have to read it and you have to stop and, you know, et cetera. So I don't know. I think 12 year olds are pretty smart. I think we should treat them like they're smart and we should start educating them. Uh, yeah. But that's the flippant like retailer. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, I would just add to, I think uh, it's, you know, people riding on a sidewalk of any age uh, is a policy failure. It's a planning failure. Um, that's not, you know, the behavior isn't the problem. It's the lack of access to a safe, protected, connected bike infrastructure network. Thank you. And that doesn't even have anything to do with e-bikes. Um, the e-bikes are just amplifying the, the, what we're calling a problem of kids riding on sidewalks. Um, but that's existed for a long time. And it's not just kids. It's in a lot of places outside necessarily the, it, the specific areas in Southern California. It's black and brown riders. It's low income riders that are being criminalized for riding on sidewalks when that's their only safe option. Um, you know, whenever we're talking about there's too many riders are getting in the way of pedestrians it's not regulating behavior that never works we've seen that tried over and over again in so many ways it's infrastructure it's finding the systems investing in the systems that make that movement safe um, and so whenever that issue is presented to me it's like oh but these dang kids on e-bikes I'm like give them a bike lane and then they won't be on the sidewalk and that's it Absolutely. And I think that makes, you know, the safety conversation and, and making infrastructure more available is absolutely something that is a big part of how we get more people out on e-bikes and on regular bikes as well. So Pete, I want to ask you as uh, someone who is from the industry, um, can you talk a little bit more about what the industry is doing in terms of uh, safety and also uh, security for uh, for e-bikes and for regular bikes as well? Yeah, you, you're, you brought up two uh, problems and Karin addressed the one a lot, which is uh, younger riders who are either uneducated or unaware of the challenges. So that's our biggest thing before us and um, other retailers or uh, are selling a bike. I think education, a bike school program or something that you take a consumer through. Um, we do it with every um, transaction we have with customers. We either send it to them or we do it in person in our retail stores as I'm well, I'm sure you and other retailers do as well. So I think educating them on the safety and understanding. We we also advise that children under 16 don't ride an e-bike at the start. You know what I mean? You want to make sure that like it's a things traveling 20 miles an hour if there's not bike lanes there's a lot of safety issues so we we want to definitely educate the um, consumer as much as possible another growing challenge you have what the e-bikes presents is their higher value than most traditional bikes that people have ridden before theft theft is a big problem and it's probably you know when i look at social media posts and i look at social media forums i see about about 20 percent of the threads around safety as well so that is another big piece there that I think we need to do as a community is educate people on safety and protection. Because if, if I as a consumer go buy a, a rat power bike and I spend you know $1,500 on that bike and two weeks later it's taken from me, I'm probably not gonna reinvest in that again because I don't trust the system. Well, unfortunately, we have to do a better job. I think all of us of educating everyone on the safety and security. You know, I was riding yesterday with a group and handed an individual helmet and I said, hey, you need to ride wear this helmet he goes I don't want to wear a helmet I said well you you can't ride one of my bikes without one and I was watching throughout the day and I'm like do you realize how fast you're going up and down hills here what would happen if something happened to you so I think that's another educational thing when you think of youngsters or people who bike traditionally the e-bike they need to wear it's just the safety that's a primary thing yeah, you're absolutely right. And as we talk about, you know, as we talk about safety and as we talk about um, e-bikes, uh, they are expensive and they are, you know, a, a lot of uh, legislators see them as toys more than uh, tools. So how do we start to convince uh, legislators that e-bikes really are a, a tool that can be useful for not just uh, businesses, but also improving some of the transportation? transportation challenges that we all face through
throughout the uh, throughout the country. No. Happy to. Um, so this has been an ongoing education campaign from the bike industry, e-bike industry, and, and you all, all you great advocates, is is helping policymakers make that shift from uh, here's a nice thing for some wealthy people in my community to go out and have fun on to this is a legitimate mode of transportation that's going to improve efficiency, uh, reduce congestion, lower emissions, get people to essential services and work. And a lot of that, you know, our first recommendation at People for Bikes is, is to get those policymakers on an e-bike, do a demo, take them to a local shop, connect them with brands based in their districts, um, and getting that first, you know, touch on an e-bike, they get that smile, they're like, oh, I get it now. And that, you know, that doesn't necessarily change their policy agenda, but it gives them the foundation to make that change. Um, and, and from there, you know, we need so much more research. Um, it's something that People for Bikes were investing heavily in is research on e-bike use cases, um, effects to infrastructure, um, how much, how many emissions are we taking out or, you know, tons of CO2 are being removed from the air by replacing car trips with e-bike trips. Um, what are the healthcare savings by getting more people on e-bikes and out outside of cars um, and like what are the social consequences of, of, of more e-bike riding. Um, research, data, statistics, that sells in policy. Um, and so those are the numbers that I use to, to make the case when I'm in front of policymakers and their staff. And then additionally, you know, getting the advocate the local brands, the local shops, the, um, you know, I work with Brad Power Bikes all the time, uh, Darren over there, to connect with, you know, your folks in the great state of Washington. They want to hear from the businesses that are doing really well in their, their areas, and that's a really powerful voice. I think combining the advocacy, the research and data, and then the business voice is really the trifecta of like getting e-bikes to the next level um, in a policy conversation. Yeah, I, I think a great example of where um where how far we still have to go in this is just what occurred a few weeks ago in California. So right when gas prices started hiking, the first thing that the uh, government came out and said is, well, we'll give gas incentives back. Like you're, you're solving the wrong problem at this stage. And so I think we have to figure out how to get our local lawmakers involved more to understanding. And I think test writing is a key example because we talked about commuting, but I tell people a lot, like half of our consumers are over 60 years old. That's what drew me to e-biking. I took a test ride and someone next to me pulled up who was older and they're like, you have no idea, I haven't been on a bike for 15 years. This is changing my life from a health standpoint, from an accessibility to a mobility standpoint. So not only commuting, we need everyone. If it's just people talking about commuting only, you're battling against oil, car companies, et cetera. But if you have everyone talking about lifestyle change, I think that's gonna help as well. Can I add something? That's um, I think that there is, there's the policy side, there's the physical infrastructure side, and then there are two other parts that are really, really important. And that is that there's human capital involved in this change, and there is cultural capital. So the first thing is that the bike community has to stop talking about e-bikes as being really expensive bikes, because in fact, they are really inexpensive transportation. They are really quality transportation. They're reliable if they're good, and they have to be good to be good transportation. Um, and so it's up to us in the room to change the conversation and to say, hey, what are we, what are we comparing this to? Because the minute I start comparing my cargo bike that takes my kid on it with a car, there is no comparison. There is absolutely no comparison. Um, and on the service side, the important thing is that if you look at a service menu for a bike shop from 1989, you'll see that the cost for a tire change was $10. Five years ago in a bike shop, the cost for a tire change was still $10. Bike shop professionals were being, are being paid up until the pandemic, minimum wage. And they are skilled people. They are more skilled than an auto mechanic is today because it is more finicky, more detailed, more difficult work. So with less safety built in, I mean, it's, I could go on and on and on. So um, finally, we're paying these people okay. 
But as a bike community, we have to understand that that's part of what we're doing, is we are raising all of that. We are raising an entire group of human capital that needs to flourish in order to allow this movement to flourish. So not policy, but culture. Absolutely, and culture is a huge part of how we get people and convince people that e-bikes are more than toys. They are transportation, and they are a mode of transportation that makes sense. And Karin, you brought up the pandemic and how in the last few years, we have seen a significant increase in the interest in e-bikes. So share with us, you know, as, as someone who runs a retailer, share with, us, share with us a little bit more of your experience of the types of folks that have been coming in and what are some of the conversations that you're having with them about uh, about moving from a regular bike to an e-bike or even from a car to an e-bike? Yeah, well, the first thing I want to say is that in 2010, when we were telling people about e-bikes and walking around with e-bikes and going to farmer's markets to sell e-bikes because we didn't have a store, the only people we didn't have to explain what this thing was to and like sell it were like the homeless people that were with us on the street. Like low income people understand how rad this is. Immediately, bam. So, and they always have. So I just want to say, it's, it's not lost on all sorts of people, a, a very diverse group of people, and that has been true for a long time. The, um, at the New Wheel, we've been very focused on transportation quality bikes for, for the whole time. So we've been selling bikes to a diverse group of people, most of whom wouldn't consider themselves probably regular bicyclists, like wouldn't feel super comfortable going into like a normal bike shop. And so for us, uh, we've, we've seen, you know, multiple growth, like multiple X growth every year for a long time. So that wasn't anything new. There were a couple of things that happened during the pandemic. During the pandemic, bicycling became more than just like what people thought broke people do to get to work or really elite people do instead of golf. It became a it became a safe pastime. And so it skyrocketed in popularity. And for regular bicycle shops who had seen their bike shops shrinking for the last 10 years or more, ever since we got doping going on with our friend Lance, bike shops have been shrinking. And it's been really rough on those bike shops. It's been like, you should love and hug every bike shop person you know, because it's hard work. Um, and what happened during the pandemic is Everybody all of a sudden had interest in their wares. They're, they sold all their bikes. And the only thing left to sell in like June of 2020 was e-bikes. And so that brought a whole new load of inventory into shops. It brought a whole new load of interest. I mean, there was already, the, the interest already existed, but it made it so that all of a sudden we had an enormous growth in who could go and just see one of these and try one of these. And their neighbor had a rat power and their other neighbor like went to the new wheel and did a test ride and thought that was cool and so it was just like it was a thing and it exploded and so the um the whole tone has changed and what happened i think for us is that we saw all of a sudden classical bicyclists like people who are hardcore bicyclists for life get interested in e-bikes and that was the transition that we had to manage so it's been i think it's been different for everybody but it's it's really that now everybody bikes and specifically everybody e-bikes <laughs> and that includes the 12 year olds it includes the 85 year olds it includes the people who you know have MS and uh, the people who are trying to get to their their job in in critical care or at a corner store or at a school um, and and so that's been a huge growth um, it's been very exciting to see and it's been a huge challenge to rise to for the infrastructure especially the bike shop and the service infrastructure that exists because it is so 
under everything. Um, so hopefully. Okay, I have one thing real quick, Kevin. So um, you mentioned like usage. We talked about commuting earlier. One of the, the biggest things we're seeing as well is like cargo, highly utilization of uh, a bike as well, um, where people are thinking about different, obviously you have like food service deliveries and other things. Um, but we had a customer, our customers love to tell us afterwards like how they're using a bike. And we had a customer the other day who sent us a picture of it and it was the, the, the most awesome, radical way I've seen it an e-bike used. So it was it was a, a wagon bike for us, which is a longer kind of cargo bike. They had a trail hook to it. And on the trailer, they had a ladder. They had tools. This was a handy person who went around, and that was their form of transportation in the LA market. And they mentioned that they can get from job to job faster. And they were pulling a probably six foot long, three foot wide trailer behind them. And I love the innovation of someone thinking differently about their business. So their business now costs what? Under $2,000 to buy the transportation. Nothing hardly at all except little, small amounts to charge a battery. And they now have a, flood, uh, you know, a business that's growing with very minimal cost and it's helping them do it more efficiently. So it's just really cool when you hear stories like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we'd love to hear more of those types of stories, but uh, just the lack of awareness. And so something that, uh, Pete, that you had sort of uh, mentioned before was you're just starting to see more and more people be aware of uh, what is possible. Um, are there other sort of stories or other uh, sort of awareness factors that, that you'd like to share? I think all of us have to help people become aware. That's a big thing because it's it's interesting. I don't know what you see in your store, but a lot of you, everyone raised their hand when we said, who's ridden an e-bike? So who has an e-bike? Okay, so that's somewhat representative. If you come into like our store, if you ride a bike, there's a high likelihood you're going to purchase a bike because of your, like the fun you have on it, obviously, how you can see it being utilized in your life. I think we need to just do it, continue to do a better job of educating and informing people of how different applications of an e-bike can be used, right? So whenever someone comes in to visit us at RAD, the first thing I always ask the customer is, how are you gonna use it? Like, let's make sure we get you on a bike that you're gonna utilize that you want. So many times people are like, well, it's, I, I, some friends had it, or I need to take my kids to school, or I need to do X, Y, or Z. And then what we try to do is say, okay, well, how else would you use it? What are some other ways? And that goes beyond just what you were talking about. Just a commuter, or just a once a use thing, it becomes part of your life where you're thinking about everything differently. Hey, I'm gonna run down to the local coffee shop. It's only a few minutes away, I'm gonna do that. Oh, I am gonna take my kids to school. Maybe I'm gonna run to the grocery store. And so I think for us, and I'm sure as an industry, we've got to help people better understand that it's not simply just a replacement for the bike you have, it is a different way to move around your city or your community. So. Yeah, it's a little really quick. Go for it. Okay. Um, what's interesting is that changing behaviors is so tricky, <laughs> right? <laughs> And this addresses the bicycle industry in itself. There are more bicycles sold in the United States than there are cars. But we don't see commercials on TV or, or media. There's no industry thing pushing bicycles the way the model industry pushes and jams cars down our throat and they create economic instead of politicians, they keep cars on the road. When is the industry going to moderate and start selling on a national basis or a regional basis or have the clout that the auto industry has? I mean, obviously, the industry has people, but you can have some clout. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, well, I think it's more for Noah. I think it's for him to make yourself. So, like, no, I, 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 I well, yeah, being part of bike industry, so leaders of multiple bike companies in the industry, so our founder, Mike Rabinbaugh, which is where the name comes from, he participates in board members for people for bikes. So we're trying to bring them together to, like, consolidate efforts because one voice alone can't change it. We've got to figure out how to bring them together, right? 
Yeah, I think it's, it's, you know, one, we don't have car money. Um, something I say a lot, but, but you're right. Like a national ad campaign, more unified. I mean, of course, if you search e-bike, you're going to know which companies are paying for ads on like Google search or, or on, on news. But, um, yeah, I mean, we're ripe for it. There's a lot of conversation about it. It's just, it's a new venture in a way that I don't think the bicycle industry has necessarily come together on a national ad campaign before. But it's also, I think the, the future of advertising is a whole other conversation uh, that I'm not qualified to speak on. And, um, but I, I think it's, it's digital, it's on social media, and you're seeing a lot of brands do that, um, the ones that have the, the capacity to, um, but there's there's absolutely you know conversation of, of people for bikes being the like industry association for bicycles um, on on how we elevate it at a national level, how we elevate e-bikes and bicycling. Um, and there was there were some examples of that um, earlier in the pandemic that we came around on. Um, but you know, hearing that it, it didn't reach you is good feedback for us um, and absolutely something for us to work on. I'm going to say something really controversial. The bicycle industry has a real problem with just being a business. Right? So, like, rad power. They're very focused on hitting a $2,000 price point. You just told me that. That's how I know that. So he told me that. That we want to make it affordable for everyone. Right. <laughs> so... But that means that you don't have the money for marketing. The car industry has been focused on changing people's behaviors at all levels, at deep levels, for a long time. So I think the change is required on everybody's part. That means that, unfortunately, we can't just point at Noah and say, hey, Noah, can you get it done for us? Thanks. Um, that's a cop-out. What we need to be doing on the bike coalition level is acting like the triple A of bicycles. Triple A went in and they went in with the express interest to undermine bicycle infrastructure and to make room for cars. And they did that culturally. They made vacations. They, you know, recommended restaurants. They gave you tire changes. They gave you maps. They gave you all the things you need to make driving a car easy. Where are our bike coalitions? Like, honestly, I belong to the bike coalition board for the San Francisco Bike Coalition. And this is my pitch to them over and over and over again. Let's make bicycling easy, convenient, fun, and let's just be AAA. Let's just take their line and just move it over to the bike industry. So I think that we all have responsibility in this. We have to stop thinking cheap. We have to reinvest in our companies, reinvest in the market, and start thinking really, really big, which is that, in fact, especially in California, most trips can be taken by bicycle. So let's just get it done. So I think with that, I want to open it up for some Q&A, uh, and I see a few hands in the audience. So first one I saw was Gary over there in the back. Yeah, hi. I'm interested in the changes of e-bikes, the e-bike user infrastructure. I think a lot of the planning for any kind of bike So just to repeat the question, uh, you're asking about whether or not we're thinking about changes to infrastructure to accommodate e-bikes. Yeah. So I think that's a good question. 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 I think that's a good question
So what I'll say at the federal level that People for Bikes is doing is having, um, we're doing a lot of communication conversations with the Department of Transportation about as we're talking and providing guidance on the implementation of the massive infrastructure bill that includes billions of dollars that could go to bike infrastructure. In that guidance, we need some specifications that are going to cities and states on bike lanes that support commercial e-cargo bikes. Um, you know, this is actually a really big problem in New York City where their bike lane regulations are pretty narrow and it's making it really difficult for commercial e-cargo bicycles to do that first last mile delivery operation. So where you have specific examples is what we need to be able to show the case this problem to DOT so they can start doing the trickle down guidance to states and localities as they get this funding to build out their bike networks. So please share your examples with me because that's fodder that I can use as an advocate at the federal level. I just, I mean, what we've seen and in San Francisco is that we're already definitely outgrowing our bike infrastructure. Um, and my pitch to our community is that what we need is we need human scale bike now by or human scale networks right so we just instead of talking about lanes like let's just take full street networks and say these are the places where people go as two-legged two-wheeled things and here are the places that are really convenient for cars we're going to keep those places separate and we'll make it as functional as possible for everybody to share this space. So that's my pitch. It's uh, slow to gain traction, but it is gaining traction, especially with the streets that were closed during the pandemic. And now we're in the process of sort of negotiating how all that goes down. But I really think we already have the infrastructure we need. We just have to restripe it and put up some like cones. Um, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. My name is uh, Kasak. I run a uh, bike mechanic education program over in West Oakland. And you touched on this briefly. Um, one of the things that's, that is great about e-bikes is that they, the salary for a starting e-bike mechanic is much higher, high enough that you can get funding for job training programs, which is impossible for a regular bike mechanic because, uh, because of the, basically they start at minimum wage. Um, the big problem is that, that I've encountered is that um, while bikes, you know, like the Rad Power bikes and the bikes that you sell are very easy to, to fix when you, when you work in that shop, you learn how to fix that bike. Do you know if there's any plans in the future for a broader education program um, to teach people how to fix e-bikes in general and not just one brand or another brand? That is a great question. Um, and we, uh, so in, in LA County, we've actually started looking at uh, partnerships with community colleges and vocational programs to hopefully provide that type of training to some extent, where it's just in its nascent stage, uh, it's early on, but it is something that we have started to think about is how do we take some of these programs where people can learn these mechanical skills, the electrical skills that are necessary to actually make themselves be more uh, be more capable and be more uh, marketable to uh, e-bike companies or to uh, micro mobility companies that rely on that technology and be able to uh, take advantage of that as a way of uh, as a way of making a living yeah and I think um, Darren on our team would, would know more about it but we just did something in West Virginia right where we donated bikes to a local uh, uh, the higher education institution where they're actually building mechanic programs. And I think that's the critical thing is, you know, you talk to, uh, you know, I've got two teenage kids that are coming out of that high school era and they're, you know, one of them's talking about like, hey, should I work on cars? And I'm like, no one's talking about bikes yet. And we've got to do a better job of helping them understand that there is a career path within this industry that is only going to grow. So there's things that we're, we as companies are doing. High school, thanks, thanks for the correction. So we did a high school program in West Virginia. Um, and I think more and more, educational, you know, educational um, foundations or organizations doing that is going to help. 
And I think one last note on that is it's important to actually start to create a pipeline early. So we've started looking at how to educate students from uh, as, as young as the elementary and middle school age to get them into biking and wrenching on their own bikes so that they start to develop that interest and to create a step all every, you know, to create a opportunity every step of the way so that at the middle school, at the high school level, and then eventually at the community college or vocational training level, they have the opportunity to move up and understand that there's actually a career path for them uh, to, uh, to actually work on bikes for the rest of their life. Uh, so in parents, uh, speed limit is 90 miles an hour. Is it, uh, an e bike that's 20, no, I'm from the No, it's for those. Oh, okay, sorry. So in parents, the speed limit is 90 miles an hour. Uh, electric bikes made like 29, the higher model. 27. 27. Yeah. Uh, should we limit speed limit for electric bikes? Um, because it seems that if we are interested in a whole picture of, of mobility, there are a lot of people that want to walk on the street, across the street. And if you have these bikes going around at 30 miles an hour, I, th I think that would make our environment more dangerous. So I wonder whether the industry is open to making the bike less appealing by slowing down its speed. So, I mean, the, the European market and the American, the landscape is very complicated and lots of things fit together, right? And um, so here in California, we have a three class system. It's modeled on the European system, which is true, which is in place in France too. In Europe, class one tops out at 15 miles an hour and class two is, or speed pedal X go to 27 and a half, uh, I think it's 35 kph. They are much more strict with how they maintain where, uh, where a speed pedal X can go and where it can't go. They are more clearly marked, they're required to have license plates, etc. They've been very proactive in Europe around what is qualified as an electric bike and what isn't and how those rules are maintained, especially in urban areas. In here in California, we actually have those rules. <laughs> it's just that a lot of bikes are outside of the class system and nobody cares. And the Im and I mean there are import rules that need to be improved to make sure that these that this is not a problem. The problem is not the rules. The problem is not maintaining the rules, and especially on the import side, I would say it's a disaster. Things are coming in from China that are not safe, should not be worked on, quite honestly, uh, by anybody. And and there's just to speak really briefly to your question, I, I think that there's a an import issue here, and there's also a insurance issue um, because you can't just work on anything. Uh, you have to like if you are going to be paid a professional professional wage there are certain levels of qualities of standards of quality that are important uh, so that's part of our cultural shift too obviously it's I think it's, we have to hold companies accountable to following those rules as well we do not sell a bike that goes over 20 miles an hour because that is the law that is the rule and so we are very much follow that and we also think that's a safe speed at which someone should travel so I think it's I think you mentioned a perfect car and like getting not letting people who want to navigate the system in to allow because you see companies all they advertise is speed and we're like you're not this is not a motorcycle this is a bike it's a class two bike this is why we have the regulations on we do hi thanks um i'm liza lester um from walk bike berkeley um one thing that i you, you spoke a little bit to the security issue of um, people stealing bikes but this is something that i feel like a lot of people aren't talking about so i ride what was initially an acoustic cargo bike with my kids when they hit 100 pounds i uh upgrade i uh retrofit it to be electric. Um, and I, I am lucky enough to own a home where I can build a shed where I can store my bike, okay? I, however, work in an office building that has a huge bike room, but every single bike parking unit is a hanging, hanging thing, right? I 
go to bike link lockers, which are showing up all over the East Bay. Wonderful, huge, secure bike lockers. My bike can't fit in it, right? If we want to open this up to folks who are living in apartment buildings, who can't lift e-bikes upstairs, to folks with mobility issues, to folks who need to leave their bikes at work, right? This is a huge missing issue, is the bike security and bar bike parking issue that I don't hear coming at, at like state levels or at, um, at the federal level that I really love, and I just love to hear your thoughts on. As we push for more incentives for people to buy e-bikes, how are we ensuring that there are places for everybody across the spectrum, not just people living in like single family homes with garages to park their bikes? Such a good question. Um, and I have two answers to that. Um, the first one from a policy standpoint is that you're right. We've, we needed to start having this conversation years ago, especially from an equity angle. If we want to make e-bikes accessible to lower income people who live in walk-up apartments in urban areas, um, we're not doing that by pushing bikes at them and not giving them a safe place to do it, 100%. Um, so at a very specific policy level, what I'm doing is working in this called the Charge Coalition. And it's a it's an advocacy organization focused on the electrification of the transportation system, um, very specifically with focus on the implementation of the infrastructure bill. And so going back to that piece of DOT guidance, something that you know we're drafting, we're in the process of drafting our principles now that we'll be sharing publicly very soon. Um, and if you aren't on our email list, please get on it. So then you'll you'll be updated. Um, but very specific to that was a very it was an intentional conversation that. I had with um, folks from groups like Transportation for America and the um, NUMO, New Urban Mobility Alliance, um, about you know how security and, and storage is part of the infrastructure network that we're talking about when we talk about bike infrastructure. It's not just the moving part, it's the storage. So we're specifically looking at guidance and potentially funding for um, storage in residential areas and in commercial areas. Um, you may be familiar you know, there's there's some programs, pilots that are starting startups in New York City that you know I think really need to start being replicated. It's a winning business model, and so if you're not like we should, the bike industry needs to be investing in that more. And that's what I tell my members daily. But it's it's we're starting the conversation too late at a policy level, but it is happening. And then. Um, the second part is, you know, as we see more incentive programs show up for e-bikes, um, you know, whether it's rebates, vouchers, tax credits, other types of pilots, one of the biggest pushbacks I get is, um, like, what about bike share? What about storage? And what about infrastructure? Again, and I, I think, you know, having programs like what could be coming out of California soon, we're not totally sure what the details will be, what was just introduced in Colorado is e-bike rebate incentive programs that give a lot of flexibility to local governments to design what works best for their community and whether that's investing in an e-bike lending library or their e-bike share program where that makes more sense from a storage perspective in their community than individual ownership by all means um, and so that's what we're looking for when we're working with cities states and the federal government on designing these types of programs is giving some flexibility and um, capacity authority to local agencies and local nonprofits or you know bids and other things to create the programs that make sense for the storage and infrastructure needs of their community. I think e-bike share is a really great solution to a lot of these problems too, but it just needs more investment. Thank you for the information that you've shared. I'm actually from Los Angeles and um, you know, my mind goes kind of everywhere when I even think about how can we introduce e-bikes in particular in communities of color. Um, there is a gap that really stands out in terms of just getting people of color on bikes, let alone e-bikes. Um, I organized an event, a community event, um, about a week ago, and the goal was that we would be able to get um, our predominantly brown and black community out on bikes to ride a new bike lane. Um, but the response was low of the brown and black population 
information that came out. And not to say that the project or event was not a success because who was there was supposed to be there, you know, at that time. Um, so basically, I think we have to acknowledge this gap that exists, which is in most cases a economic gap, which is a historic problem in America. But at the same time, why do we have e-bikes? My understanding is uh, it is an environmental um, number one solution and that our black and indigenous people of color, which is a large population, for instance, in um, my community, West Adams, we have roughly about um, out of 30,000 people that live in that community, at least 20,000 of them are brown and black. So they're part of the solution for our climate crisis, yet they're not in this conversation, yet they're not on bikes. So what's the, we're not gonna really get to where we need to go until we first make sure that we get our black indigenous people of color involved in this conversation, um, that they are economically compensated and that they are trained uh, to become leaders um, in order to save our planet, in order to save human life. Um, so I guess my question on that is that I do, I wanted to get your take. Number one, I think schools, churches, community centers like YMCA would be key locations that we can start um, developing policy around, developing um, our education. Um, that, that, that's just where I go because we need to start early, like you said. Um, and then in terms of, I just wanted to get all of your takes on how are you gathering data for these issues that I just named from a policy level in DC um, to how are, what is your equity lens in terms of being able to address this most vital problem, which is that black and brown lives are like, are you crazy? I'm not gonna ride on Adams. I'm not gonna ride on Washington, I mean, on Western, even even though LA DOT and organizations like that are involved. And I want to be by you guys. What I see is that uh, there are, like, there's a huge impetus to actually get very serious about what people, the low income, like low income people, generally speaking, what they need in order for this to be viable for them. Uh, because capitalism is, American capitalism isn't doing very well for a lot of people right now. And you see that, this is another unpopular thing I'll probably say, I'll probably tweak somebody out of place on this one, but privatization of e-bike share and these floating e-bike models are not good for people who need reliability. And if you are low income, you need reliability. I think it's horrible to say, oh yeah, just open up the app and uh, hopefully you'll have a bike you can get to work on. <laughs> like, okay, that's not a good solution if I'm at a low income level. Um, and so, there is so much room for progress. That's my hopeful side, right? There's also like at our store, and if you look at my store, it looks fancy, you know, like people think we're really fancy, but the people we work with are very normal, like very, you know, we, I mean, we help really fancy people too, if we have to, you know, um, but, but we help people at every economic level because that's our mission. We don't care how much you make. It does not matter. And so there's a, I don't have a really specific answer for you other than that. I know that there are so many opportunities and that, and that what we have to do is we have to get, um, what I see like in the bike coalition that I work with is that they're doing a lot of, of looking at these communities instead of like just being in them. And um, so that's what we ought to do. I don't know. And we also have to encourage those people. I think the bike community is very intimidating. Like as a, 
as a white woman, I am intimidated in the bike community, right? I go into these rooms and like, it's a new thing to not just have a bunch of bros at every bike event. That has happened in the last 10 years while I've been in it. And so if you have any otherness about you in our community, you may not be, uh, very welcome. Um, and so I just, I just think, shoot, let's just be so kind to each other. We were talking earlier um, because Kevin was worried that we were going to have a bunch of uh, e-bike haters in here, which we might have some quiet e-bike haters. We'd love to hear from from you. Um, but, uh, but my point really is that this platform is a joyous, freaking wonderful thing. Like we get to be so happy on our e-bikes. We get to be so generous and so joyful and that means we don't have to have any like weirdness between each other so that's how I see it I don't know I think there's so much possibility but we got to get really more real with ourselves and less like us and them and just get in it together and like go on some bike rides I don't know this gentleman really wants to ask a question I know I've been very concerned with the problem I've had biking in bike lanes that have been blocked by cargo vans. I don't know how many people have had that problem. <laughs> cargo vans. And I think that local governments should be working to legislate the laws to 